blessing to be here today. Get to watch three people make a public confession of their faith in Jesus through baptism. That is just such a victory, such a joy, and uh, such a victory for the church. And so we, we rejoice and what a great, powerful time of worshiping the Lord today. Thank you for coming. For those of you watching us right now on our live stream, we welcome you as well. And we trust that you'll be blessed as a result of what the Lord is about to say to you. Well, last week I started talking to you on the subject of praying for those who do not know Jesus Christ, praying for those who are lost and they need Jesus to be their savior. And I shared with you that much of my life as I would pray for people to come to faith in Christ, I would almost beg God. It was like, oh God, please save my friend. Oh God, please save my loved one. And and I would plead, and, and then I would go and I would get around them, and I would kind of look to see if I saw any evidences that God was maybe at work in their life. And maybe they would just continue on in whatever lifestyle they were in, and I would sort of conclude that I guess God's not doing anything. So then I would go back to prayer again, and it's like I would double down. Oh, God, please. Oh, God, please. Lord, please save. Please do something. And I found that my praying was almost with the attitude that I thought God wasn't doing it and that I somehow, if I prayed enough or I prayed fervently enough, if I prayed hard enough, I might could convince God to save my friend. But what we looked at last week is God is not the problem. God is not opposing people coming to Christ. The Bible is very clear that the one who opposes people coming to Christ is the devil and his demonic forces. The Bible tells us that just as there is a true God and there is a living God, there is a true devil. Same Bible teaches both. The Bible tells us that this one that we call the devil, he goes by the name Lucifer or Satan, and that he fell from heaven, and that along with him, a third of the angels fell, and they became what we call demons. And the devil is the one who opposes people coming to Christ. The Bible tells us that he is a spiritual entity, a spiritual personality, and he has a spiritual army. And we are involved in a spiritual war to bring people to faith in Christ. And when you're in a spiritual war and you're fighting spiritual enemies, you need spiritual weapons. Bullets won't do any good, right? Swords and spears and things like that won't, won't do any good. You need spiritual weapons. And prayer is a spiritual weapon God has given to his children to enable us to defeat the devil and set captives free. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, the spiritual weapon of prayer and how do you pray for those that you know need Jesus? How do you use this weapon in the spiritual war against the spiritual en enemy that your friends and your family and your loved ones might come to faith in Christ. I want us to look, first of all, at a passage many of us are familiar with, sort of set the stage of this spiritual war. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10 through verse 20. The scripture says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Heavenly realms is a, another way of saying the spiritual world, the spiritual dimension. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then 
with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So this, the scripture says that we are not fighting flesh and blood. People are not the enemy. The enemy are spiritual beings. The Bible calls the devil and his demonic forces. And they are they're listed here in almost military terms, almost showing that there is a rank and an organization to this demonic army. There are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in this world. And so we have a spiritual army, and the Bible says, put on this armor of God that you can stand against the devil's schemes. The devil has a plan for your life, just like God has a plan for your life. The devil has a scheme. Now, I don't, the devil is not God's equal. I love that song that we ended with, that Jesus, he has no rival, he is no equal. Let me tell you, Jesus and Satan are not in an arm wrestling contest where Jesus is barely eking it out. The devil is actually already defeated, but he is limited. He can only be at one place at one time. The devil cannot read your mind. But he's a pretty good judge of character. He's got an awful lot of experience down through the ages of working with people like you and me, and people with your personality types, and people with your strengths and your weaknesses. And so he comes up with a scheme, and he has his demonic forces who study you, and they understand you, and they seek to put traps in your way to capture you, to defeat you. So the Bible says, put on the armor of God. And so he lists all these different pieces of the armor. And what I want you to notice from that is the armor is pretty much defensive. It's to protect you when you are attacked. But there is one piece of the armor that is offensive that you use in the, an attack. That is the sword of the spirit. So he says, take up the sword of the spirit that he doesn't leave us guessing what that is. He said, which is the word of God. The term word there is the Greek word rhema. There are several words in, in the Greek language that we translate in English as word. One of them is logos. Have you ever heard that term logos? Logos, it's kind of a complicated term, and, but it, it, for our purposes, it sort of means the word of God in its entirety. So this Bible would be like the logos, the word of God. But rhema is a Greek word that means a spoken word, a word it's always referencing some, a word that is spoken out loud. And it's also talking about a specific word. So if the logos is the entire Bible, the rhema is a specific verse that has to do with that particular attack or that particular specific uh, temptation of the enemy, okay? So when the Bible says, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, it means take up when you are under attack over whatever the temptation is, then you take up a specific verse of scripture that has to do with that particular temptation and you speak it out loud against the enemy, okay? So that's the sword of the spirit. Now, putting on your defensive weapon or defensive armor and then taking up the offensive weapon, then he says, praying always with all kinds of prayer on all kinds of occasions and pray for me. So prayer is the battleground. Prayer is another weapon that is given to us 
in this spiritual war. So prayer is a weapon, a spiritual weapon given to you by God to defeat the devil and set the prisoners free. Now the Bible teaches us that God is not the problem why people don't come to faith in Christ. God, the Bible says, wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. The Bible tells us very clearly, we looked at it last week, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. The opposition is the devil. And the Bible tells us very clearly, he is at work in the lives of those who don't know Jesus to keep them from coming to faith in Christ. Let's look at some of those verses that teach us this. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26 says, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. The word taken captive there literally means taken alive. It literally means that the devil has trapped people and he has taken them as prisoners of war. Lost people are prisoners of war. They are trapped, they are enslaved, they are captured. The Bible refers to them in that way. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus stood in the synagogue in Nazareth and he quotes a passage out of Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to set at liberty those who are captive to set the prisoner free. People without Jesus are prisoners. They are enslaved. They are trapped. They're in bondage, trapped by the devil. It's also interesting that he says, that God says that we need to work that these, and pray that these people will come to their senses. Because part of the devil's trap is he confuses people. And he keeps them confused by lies and by deception. It's interesting that in in the the, the, uh, parable of the prodigal son, The Bible says the prodigal son, he ends up in the pig pen. You remember that story? And then it says he's in the pig pen. He's eating the the food that the hogs have. He longs to eat that. And And it says one day he came to himself. He came to his senses. And he's just like he's going, what am I doing here? I can go back to my father's house and live better than this. And so the devil keeps people lost by confusing them where they're not in their right mind. Has, have you ever wondered? I mean, you think about this. God offers to every person the greatest gift in the world. God offers the free gift of eternal life in his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God offers people a gift. It's his son, Jesus. And when they give their life to Jesus, they get forgiveness of their sins. They become children of God. They become, they, they, they are born into God's family. They are given eternal life. They get to live with God forever in heaven and in paradise. And God says, it's free. You can have all that for free. And the majority of the world says, no thanks. It doesn't make sense. No one turns down a free gift, much less the greatest gift that could ever be offered. Why do people do that? Because they don't think, they're not thinking straight. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and even if our gospel, our good news that I just shared is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, that's another title for Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel, the good news that is displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The enemy, Satan, blinds the minds of unbelievers. You share the truth and it's just like they just can't see it. They're blinded spiritually. Trapped, confused, 
prisoners of war blinded to the light of the good news. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning of verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and when you followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air. There's another title of Satan, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now, right now, at work in those who are disobedient. The spirit who is at, or the spirit who is at work. That term there, work, is a, the Greek word energeo. It is the same word used, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, that says it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So God is at work in the lives of his children, but the devil, the Bible says, is at work in the lives of those who don't know God. You ever heard someone say, well, man, man, the devil's working. Well, he is. The Bible says he is at work in the lives of those who do not know him. Blinded, not thinking clearly, confused, trapped, prisoners of war, the devil at work in their lives. That wasn't bad enough if somebody does try to reach out to them and someone tries to share the gospel with them. The devil opposes those who are trying to get the message to them. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul writes, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may, be, may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from who? The evil one. So when someone is trying to share Christ, trying to spread the message, the evil one attacks often through evil people. Not always, but he will oppose if that's not enough, the Bible says that when someone who's, who doesn't know Jesus hears the message of the gospel, the devil does everything he can do to steal that message away. You remember Jesus telling this, the parable of the, the, uh, the sower or the seed? And he talks about a sower goes forth and he spreads forth seed. Some of the seeds fell on, on uh, the path. Some fell on rocky soil. Some fell among the thorns. And, and some... Uh, produced great fruit. And so he talks about four different types of soil and reception to the word of God. The seed is the word of God, Jesus says. So he explains this parable later on, and he says in verse 18 of Matthew 13, Jesus says, listen then to the parable, what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The devil is at work trying to keep them from God, trapped, blinded, not thinking clearly, and even when they hear the truth, he tries to oppose those who share the truth, and even when they hear the truth, he tries to steal that message away that they don't remember it and think about it. Jesus, in the rest of that parable, he said, now some of the seed, it falls on rocky soil, which is real shallow soil, but it, the, the, no roots go down. And so it immediately springs up. But then when the persecution comes, trouble comes, they fall away. They weren't really committed. Where's the persecution come from? The evil one. The third type of soil, he says, and some of it falls among the thorns. And the thorns, Jesus says, are the cares of this world. He said, some people, they, 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 they receive this, the seed, but then the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches chokes out the soil, chokes out the seed, and there's no fruit. The devil uses this world system, the distractions, the deceive, deception of riches, and all those things to keep people from Christ. One more passage. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus one time had a man come up to him who was demon-possessed. And Jesus cast the demon out of this man. The religious rulers who were standing there watching it, they, uh, they said, well, the reason he could do that is because he cast out these demons by the power of Beelzebub, another name for Satan. 
And Jesus gave this famous reply. He said, well, if Satan is fighting Satan, how can his kingdom stand? A house divided will fall. Then Jesus went on to say, and if I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, well, your Jewish exorcists who cast out demons, what power do they use? Then Jesus says this verse in verse chapter 12, verse 28, but if by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house, carry off his possessions, unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. So Jesus ends this episode by saying, this man who was demon possessed, he belonged to Satan. He was part of Satan's household. And the only way that he could be delivered from Satan's household was the strong man or Satan or the demon had to be bound so that that person could be set free, right? So the Bible tells us we have spiritual foes in real demons, a real devil, a real evil one the Bible describes who are intentionally at work constantly trapping, enslaving, taking as prisoners of war, keeping people from understanding the truth, blinding them to the truth, opposing people who try to share the truth with them, stealing the message away from them. All of that is going on all the time in the life of the person that you want to come to Christ. And there's nothing that you and I, there are no weapons that we can wield that will, in our own strength, set them free. But God has given us spiritual weapons. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, the weapons we have, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, these passages, that, those verses, have application for believers, but they also have application for unbelievers. And the idea here is that there are strongholds that are built up in the lives of, of believers, but also in the lives of unbelievers to keep us from God. A stronghold, imagine it's a fortress, like a castle or a fort. It's a fortress. It's a stronghold. It is walls that are built up to protect and keep that inside from being uh, under attack. And the Bible says that there are strongholds that are built up in the lives of people to keep them from coming to Jesus Christ. But the weapons we use, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to pull down those strongholds. And those weapons are prayer and the Word of God. So, how do we use those weapons? How do you actually pray in such a way as to begin to tear down these strongholds and set prisoners free? Well, one of the ways you could do that is to personalize the scriptures. Now, let, let me illustrate it this way. We, we live in a time where modern warfare is, is just, some of the weaponry that is available today is just mind-boggling. Some of the things we know about is just astounding, and we don't even know a lot of the stuff that is probably out there. But one of the things that has been developed over the last number of years are laser-guided mu munitions, laser-guided missiles. They are designed in such a way that they can be deployed, they can be uh, fired from a jet or from uh, even a, a shoulder um, rocket launcher or uh, from a ship, from a cruise missile could be. But any of these munitions that, have, that are laser guided, they have a sensor in them that when they detect a laser, they will go right to the point where that laser is pointing and they will hit with pinpoint accuracy. The goal being to 
to lessen the collateral damage of, of the attack and the explosion. Well, how do you get a laser pointed at the target so that the munitions can hit the target? Well, oftentimes the way that's done is that our military will send a special elite group, special forces, into enemy territory where they will identify the target and then they will shine a laser on the target and call for the hit. And when the rocket is fired, the missile is fired, it will follow that laser and hit perfectly, pinpoint accuracy where the laser is aimed. That is an illustration of prayer. The problem in praying for the lost is not that God doesn't want to save, he does. It's that we have an opposition who's trying to keep them enslaved with lies and all these strongholds he's built up. So prayer is you and me shining the laser, pinpointing and identifying where the hit is going to come, where, where God's power is going to fall. So when you're praying for this person that you know that is lost, your loved one, your friend, whoever, my neighbor, my, whoever it might be, then take verses of Scripture, the rhema of God, take verses of Scripture and put their name in it, personalize it. For example, you could take a verse that we all know and love, John 3.16, and you could say, for God so loved John that he gave his only son, that if John will just believe in him, he will not perish but have everlasting life. Or you can look another verse that, that says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Put your friend's name in there. The Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and save my friend Judy. The Bible says that God is not willing that John should perish, but that John should come to repentance. Well, God would have Judy to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But God demonstrated his love towards Sam that while he was still a sinner, Christ died for him. You can take numbers of verses of Scripture and personalize it, okay? And when you do, you are shining the laser. You are pinpointing the target. You're using the Word of God, the weapon, and prayer, and you're putting them together, and you're pointing it at the target. Second of all, when you're praying for this friend, it might be, if you know them well enough, you might be very aware of some of the tools the devil's using to keep them away from Christ. For example, you may know, you can look at their life and tell that maybe they've got an alcohol problem or a drug problem, and you know that the devil is using that as a tool to keep them separated from God. Or maybe it's an immoral relationship that they're involved in. Or maybe there's some influence in their life, some friend or some person they're hanging out with that's, that keeps them pulled away from God. They're a bad influence. Maybe it's pride. Maybe they were wounded somewhere along the way. Maybe Maybe they were in church and somewhere along the way and they got hurt and disappointed and so they turned their back on God. Maybe, maybe a tragedy happened to their life and they blame God for it and that keeps them from it. Or maybe they're intellectual and they think they got all these questions and, and whatever. I don't know what it is, but sometimes you may know at least what some of these strongholds are. And if so, if let's just say that it's pride. Well, then you could find a verse of Scripture that has to do with humility. And you could say, dear God, my friend John is filled with pride. And the Bible says you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And so you plug his name in there and you quote that passage of Scripture and you attack the specific stronghold that Satan is using to try to keep him from Christ. And so whatever that stronghold might be, you can pray specific verses in their behalf to attack and tear down those strongholds. Does that make sense? A third thing you can pray is that we, we went, went through a, a list of ways that the Bible says the devil works to keep your friends and loved ones from Christ. So, for example, you can pray, like in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says that perhaps they will come to their senses and escape the snare or trap of the devil who's taking them captive to do his will. So you can pray, oh God, enable them to come to their senses. 
God, cause their mind to be clear. God, enable them, Lord, to understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, The God of this world blinds the minds of unbelievers. Dear dear God, would you open their understanding? Would you open their spiritual eyes? Would you shine the light in the darkness? So you pray specifically. We're, We're told that the devil works in the lives of those who don't know him. So dear God, would you hinder the work? Of the, in the lives of my friend. Would you stop the devil's work and don't let him succeed in his schemes? Would you send someone, God, to share Christ with my friend? Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 one day looked and saw the crowds. And he, the Bible says he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were harassed and oppressed. And he says to his disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send somebody to help them. And so you can do that. That's something you can pray for your friends or loved ones. They may not even be living anywhere around you. And so you could pray, oh God, would you send someone into the life of my friend that will be a good example? Someone that will show what a real Christian really is? Somebody that will love them? Somebody that will love others? Somebody that will be gracious? Somebody that will be kind? Somebody that you see Jesus in them? Would you send somebody to tell my friend about Jesus? That's another way to pray for your friend. You can pray when the message is shared that, that God will not let the enemy steal the seed and the message of the word. So you take the word of God as it has to do with how it applies to your friend's life and you pray that for them. Knowing this, God wants your friend to be saved. He's provided the way for your, way, your friend to be saved in the person of his son, what Jesus did for them. He's given that message to you, and he's given you and me the weapons so that you and I can shine the laser on the target so that when we're praying, God is working. Now, if you say to me, well, why do we have to do that? Why does that have to be done for people to be saved? And the answer to that is, I don't know. I don't know. God didn't have to do it that way. But God has chosen to operate in this world and bring about his will in this world through the prayers of his people. God has set up certain laws. He set up certain physical laws in this world. We have a law of thermodynamics. We have the law of gravity. We have laws that, we, that are just set up, laws of nature. Well, there are certain spiritual laws that God put in place as well, and one of those spiritual laws is God works through the prayers of his people. Even things he wants done, he waits for his children to ask him for it. So he does it. That's what Jesus taught us in the model prayer. Jesus says, this is how you pray. Pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glorify your name. Well, why should we have to ask God to glorify his name since God wants to glorify his name? Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father, glorify your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said your father wants his will to be done on earth, but he wants you to ask him to do that. The heavenly father wants your friend, your loved one to be saved, but he wants you to ask him. And so as you ask him, he works and he gets the glory. So when you pray for those who don't know Jesus, don't pray in unbelief like I did for years, begging and pleading with God as though he doesn't want to save your friend. And, and the opposite of that, pray in faith, believing and understanding the only reason you even care that your friend or your family member needs Jesus is because God has put that concern in your heart. The only reason you have any desire for them to be saved is because God desires it and God has put that in your heart. And the very concern you have for your friend is the promise from God that he wants to work in the life of your friend. So pray in faith, pray in confidence, and pray knowing that when you're praying, God is working and God's power is falling on the target that you have pinpointed. I want you to bow your heads. It might be that somebody listening right now over our live stream, or maybe someone in this room, you've never received personally God's gift of his son, Jesus. Maybe you've known a lot about Jesus. Maybe you've gone to church all your life. 
Maybe you got family members that claim to be Christians, followers of Jesus. But has there ever been a time when you personally asked Jesus to save you? Where you realized you needed a savior? That you realized that your sins had separated you from God? You see, we've all sinned. That just means disobedience to God. We've all disobeyed God a lot. And our sins create a barrier between us and God, separation. The Bible calls that separation spiritual death. Cut off from the life of God. And the Bible says the wages, what we earn for our sin is spiritual death, separation from God. It happens to all of us. And there's nothing you and I can do about it. Our, that separation from God, there's nothing you have the power to do to ever remove your sins. But God loves you and God wants a relationship with you. He wants you to live with him forever. So God sent Jesus. And Jesus came and died on the cross. And when Jesus was on that cross, the Bible clearly says that God took your sins, all of them, and he nailed it to the cross with Jesus. And while Jesus was on that cross, God began to treat Jesus the way that you deserve to be treated for your sin. He was a substitute for you. The cross was judgment on your sins. And God judged Jesus for your sins as though he was the one who had committed them. And God, Jesus took the wrath of God and he paid the penalty for your sin. And Jesus died. And when he died, that was the penalty for your sin. But he died for you. He died so you wouldn't have to. He died in your place. But three days later, God raised him from the dead. And when God raised him from the dead, it was a gigantic announcement, a declaration that the payment had been accepted. And now to everyone who will place their faith in Jesus, who will cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, I want you to save me. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the Bible says the wages of sin is death, spiritual separation. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God offers you a gift today. I mean, really, it's a gift. It's free. And he wants you to have it. He wants you to have his son Jesus and forgiveness and become his child and a brand new start and a home in heaven and so much more. And he offers it to you right now, but he won't make you do it. He wants you to ask him. But he promised everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So everybody right now in this room, everyone watching right now who will call out to Jesus shall be saved if you want it. And if that's what you want, pray something like this. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned and my sins have separated me from God. But I believe you died on the cross in my place. You were judged for my sins. And I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again from the dead on the third day. And my sins have been paid for by your sacrifice. Now I'm asking you to come into my life. Save me from my sins. Make me your child. 
give me eternal life as you promised. A home in heaven. A relationship with God. And from this day forward, I will follow you with my life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, nothing magical about that prayer, but if that was an expression of what you really want, then I got great news for you. You just became a child of God, and I welcome you to the family of God. We rejoice with you today. It's the best decision you could ever make. And now that you've given your life to Jesus, every sin you've ever committed or will ever commit has just been, it's forgiven. The, the, there's not even a record of it anymore. You've got a brand new start in life. You've become a child of God. You have eternal life, a home in heaven, and so much more. And so you've just started all over again, a brand new life. And so now what do you do? Well, that's the purpose of a church. A church is to help you know what to do next, get to know God better. That's why we exist. So if you prayed that prayer with me just a moment ago, would you let us help you get to know God better and know what to do next? You can do that by taking the gray card that's in the seat back in front of you. Just put your name and a contact information on there and check the box on the card that says, today I prayed to ask Jesus to save me from my sins. As you make your way out, if you'll drop that filled out card in the offering box, we'll contact you this week and see if there's a time that it's convenient for you that we could sit down with you and just uh, try to help you know what to do next. It'd be a joy to do that. Maybe you'd like to be baptized. Um, Becky, who was baptized uh, this morning, uh, she said a few weeks ago she saw others being baptized and she realized, I don't have to be perfect. I can be baptized too. And so maybe you're here today would say, you know, I've never been baptized. I'd like to be. Take the gray card. Check that box. Maybe You'd like to join the church. Just take the gray card, check that box. Drop those filled out cards in the offering box. If you're our guest, thank you for coming. I hope that you sensed the Lord here. I hope you felt welcomed when you came. I hope that the Lord spoke to you and you walk out here today knowing that, that God uh, spoke to you. And if that's the case, then if you wouldn't mind, if you'd take the blue card that's in the seat back in front of you, to take you about 10 seconds to fill it out and just drop that card in the offering box. I promise we're not going to stalk you. We're not going to hassle you. We just want to touch base with you and say thank you for coming. Open up a line of communication with you. So I hope you'll let us do that. So thank you. If you um, are a member of our church and as you walk out today, don't forget to give your offerings to the Lord. You can do that by putting them in the offering box or you can always give online. Uh, that's a very, very convenient way to do that. And uh, so I hope that you will uh, give faithfully to the Lord. Let's stand together. We're going to be dismissed. Did I forget anything? That's it? Okay, I got it. All right. Let me pray for you and we will be dismissed. Thank you so much for coming. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that you've opened our eyes. That those of us who know you, there was somewhere along the way somebody was praying for us. I thank you, God, that you opened our understanding. We came to our senses. We saw the truth. And Lord, we were able to embrace that truth. And you delivered us, Lord, from, the, from bondage. And you delivered us from captivity. And you made us your children. And you set us free. And Lord, you are an amazing Savior. You're the wonderful Lord. And it is a joy and a privilege to serve you and to identify with you and be your ambassadors in this world. Lord, you have called us to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And as we go out this week into enemy territory, I pray for your people. The Lord, we would be filled with your spirit, empowered by you. And may we take up the weapons that you have placed at our disposal. And would you use us this week to accomplish your will. And may your kingdom come. May your will be done this week through your people. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.